Okay, so First Samuel and chapter 1 and verse 24 is where we're going to begin our reading. And uh, we will read through to chapter 2 and verse 11. So it begins this way, uh, 1 Samuel 1 verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord, as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, mine horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich, he bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. And Elkanah went to Rama to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. And God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. And we've moved really from Hannah, the woman of prayer, uh, into Hannah, the woman of praise. And we're going to see something of her uh, praise to the Lord here. And really the first section, chapter 124 through 28, uh, we're thinking of a vow fulfilled and prayer answered. And of course, it's concerning Samuel. And remember, we said last time that Samuel means asked of God or, or heard of God. And very fitting, uh, not just uh, commemorative in a sense of the fact that he was uh, an answer to a prayer. He was heard of, uh, in a sense, a demonstration that uh, Hannah was heard of God, but perhaps even prophetic of his life, because he would be a man whose prayers would be heard of God. And uh, one thing that we're going to see as we go through 1 Samuel is that Samuel was a mighty man of prayer. And I might say this, that any biblical hero that we read about pretty much was known for their communion with God. Uh, what makes a man great, and any hero in church history, what makes a man great really is time spent in the presence of God. And we can't get away from that. As much as we would like to, God does not bless our activity. Activity 
uh, that is not based on intimacy is just a lot of noise. It's really not very profitable. And so let me just read a few scriptures uh, concerning, as we're going to look at the life of Samuel, concerning his prayer life. First Samuel 7, verse 5. Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. Chapter 8, verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Chapter 12. First Samuel chapter 12 and verse 19. 12 verse 19. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. So they ask him to pray because they know he's a man of prayer. Verse 23, his response, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. And of course, he taught the good and the right way by his example, by being that man of prayer. Chapter 15. 1 Samuel 15 and verse 11. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandment. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So even part of his repertoire included an all-night prayer meeting. So I think we can say without hesitation that his name he, he, if ever there was a man that lived up to his name, it was Samuel. Heard of God. He knew that he existed because, because God had heard the cries of his mother. And then his whole life was a demonstration of the fact that he knew God heard the cries of his children. And so he was a great man of prayer. And again, we, we don't want to slide by this. We've looked at Hannah and her prayer life. Now we've seen the son stirred to the same fervency in prayer. And it was, of course, need that drove them there. It was her need of the barrenness being taken away that drove her to a place of prayer. And he now is uh, kind of put into this position of being a judge and a leader in his Israel. And, and his need drove him to the place of prayer. And it's a sad thing, really, that we don't see how needy we really are. Because if we really understood how needy we were, we'd all pray more. And I suspect that when we get towards the end of our lives, and I've heard this from many a servant of God, uh, they, they were asked if they were, you know, if they had that time again, what would they have done differently? And they all said the same thing. I would have prayed more. I would have prayed more. We don't want to stand before the Lord and wish we had prayed more. Let's, let's take to heart this uh, exhortation, really, and the example of both Hannah and Samuel. And let's devote ourselves to seeking the face of God in prayer, because surely the need demands it. We're living in awfully difficult days. Uh, very, very similar in a sense to the days of judges. Everybody's doing that which is right in their own eyes. Uh, wickedness is abounding on every side and how we need to become people of prayer. And so it says in verse 24, when she had weaned him, and we said approximately three years of age as uh, she has finished this process of weaning him and she's now about to fulfill her vow. Uh, they took with them. Uh, three bullocks. One of them was uh, required from Numbers 30 uh, in terms of the, the completion of a vow. Uh, they were to offer uh, a bullock uh, in bringing the vow to completion, and they're going to complete this vow. And the others were probably just free will offerings as, uh, as a way of showing their gratitude to the Lord. A uh, bottle of wine, again, poured on the sacrifice, kind of symbolic of joy, their joy in giving these things to the Lord. And so they brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And so they slay the bullock, 
They brought the child to Eli. And uh, I want you to notice what she says uh, as she brings the, the bullock to, to Eli in verse 26. It says, she said, oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. Now, I want you to notice what she said, and I want you to notice what she didn't say. See, it would have been very easy for her to say this. I am the woman you so rashly judged at the tabernacle entrance. And this is the child for which I was praying when you charged me with drunkenness, you old scoundrel, you. You know what I'm saying? She, she really could have kind of really thrown it in his face. But I want you to notice that there's no resentment whatsoever for the wrongs done to her. She's just very filled with gratitude that the Lord has answered her prayer. And again, it's a very practical lesson for all of us because it's very easy to be resentful of those who misunderstand and misrepresent us. I was talking to a, a, a brother in uh, the Lord's work and I, he, he asked me advice. And my, my piece of advice to him was, you need to develop skin like a rhinoceros hide. And he looked at me and said, what do you mean? I said, because the people will say a lot of things about you and uh, they'll misunderstand you, they'll misjudge you, and you can't let it get to you because it will destroy you. And I think there's a sense in which we need to uh, recognize that uh, comes with the territory, uh, criticism, misunderstanding, mis being misjudged, but we've got to be careful that we don't allow these things to cause a root of bitterness to develop in our hearts. And I just love the spirituality. I'm going to bring it out to, today, particularly the spirituality of this woman in a day of departure and a day of declension, that there's no trace whatsoever of any resentment. And it's interesting for us, even sometimes when we have done something wrong and those who are charged with the duty of correcting us and admonishing us, sometimes when they do that out of love for us, we still resent it. And uh, we, we just need to get over ourselves. <laughs> I think that's part of our problem is that we're just uh, so self-obsessed, self-focused, that we don't like it even when we're rightfully corrected. And here's the big test. Uh, when your wife corrects you, how do you respond? <laughs> That's the challenge, isn't it? Because uh, we, we can hear it from other people, but sometimes those closest to us, when they say, uh, you were wrong, we immediately get defensive and we get kind of uh, bent out of shape and all that kind of thing. We just need to be uh, learn from Hannah uh, just wonderful that she shows no resentment whatsoever. And she comes and she tells uh, Eli that I'm that woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. And then she has a wonderful demonstration in verse 27. She says, for this child I prayed and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. And we might ask the question, do, do we have any Samuels in our lives? Specific and definite answers to prayer that we can point to and say, for this I prayed and the Lord heard and has given me my petition. I wonder, do we have anything like that? I know one assembly and uh, they were... Uh, concerned about the prayer meeting. And they, they decided what they would do is they'd have a very visual illustration. So they had two big jars and they had marbles. And every time they had a specific prayer request, they put a marble in one uh, jar, which was the prayer jar. And then when a prayer was answered, they removed the marble from the prayer jar into the answered prayer jar. And it said it was interesting over the years, how the, the, the transfer occurred where the, jar, the answered prayer jar got fuller and fuller and fuller of marbles because they had definite, specific Samuels. For this, I prayed. And it's good to, some people keep a journal of prayer requests and answered prayers. That's a good, good discipline, a good habit uh, to put down your prayer request. And, and then as the Lord answers, 
And so it's good to have those things. Do we have any Samuels in our lives? Do we have any that we could say, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition? Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Now here's a very interesting thing. She returns to the Lord that which he had given to her in answer to her petition. So she's fulfilling this vow. She wasn't one that vowed a vow and later repented and regretted making the vow. She fulfilled it. Now, can you imagine how difficult this must have been? Uh, clearly, she's a woman who was filled with natural affection. And we're going to see throughout 1 Samuel, we're going to see this kind of principle played out where people are faced with a choice. Do I put the Lord first or do I put my children first? We're going to see it with Eli. Eli put his children over the Lord, right? He didn't rebuke them. He didn't, he didn't do what he should have done and he favored them. Uh, we're going to see even the Philistine cart. You know, it's uh, as the cart goes, it, he, the, 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 the cows hear the lowing of their calves and everything natural in them would cause them to want to turn back. But they went against it. So we're going to just see that whole thing uh, where a test and she was, she was willing and freely gave up her only begotten son at this moment. Right? She didn't have any other child because the cause of God demanded it and the vows of God were upon her. How godlike is this? And again, where is she going to leave this three year old? She's going to leave this three year old in the care of Eli. Now, he does not have a, tr a, a good track record in child care and child training. He's raised two boys and they're wicked, right? Uh, the, the whole environment of Shiloh is departure, evil, and wickedness. And that, that yet here she is entrusting her only son into their care. And you have to say, this woman had amazing faith in the plans and purposes of God to do this thing. Incredible faith that God is going to look after her boy, that he, he's going to uh, turn him into a man of God, despite everything that would shout against that possibility. She believes God. And she, she brings this boy and gives him in fulfillment of a vow. And again, we might ask, you know, God has given us, everything we have comes to us from the Lord. What have we given back to him? What have we given to him? And I think we need to start with ourselves, right? If we've not done Romans 12, 1 and 2, maybe today's a good morning to do it. If you have done it, and maybe you've got off the altar, because the danger with a living sacrifice is that it tends to wander off the altar. Maybe it's time to get back on. In the light of the mercies of God, all that he's done for us, we should present ourselves back to him and say, Lord, here I am, not much, but what, such as I am, I present myself fully to you, to do whatever you want, full surrender, your will, not my will be done. What a difference it would make to the assemblies in the Maritimes or whoever's listening to this at some future date, what a difference it would make if we really were on the altar of sacrifice and lived the kind of life the Lord would have us to do. So it, it ends with a very strange uh, statement. It says, and he, worship the Lord there. And the strangeness of the statement is we're really not sure who the he is. Is it Eli? Is it three-year-old Samuel? Is it Elkanah? Is it all of them? We're, 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 there's nothing in the text that would tell us who the he is. But what we do know is this, that this chapter 
began with weeping and ended with worship. And that's a wonderful ending, isn't it, to the chapter? Beginning with weeping, ending with worship. And I suspect that maybe there's a sense of all three. Maybe Elkanah was worshiping because he went along with his wife in this fulfillment of the vow. Maybe even at three years of age, that seems very young, but maybe he was worshiping too, uh, uh, our hero Samuel. And maybe even old Eli was caused to bow and worship as he saw this kind of sacrifice, this kind of uh, amazing dedication. And it brings us very nicely, as we think of worship, to chapter two in this delightful praise poem of Hannah in verses one, two, ten through, through ten. And a, a, a very interesting exercise and we don't have time to do it this morning, but it would be good sometime uh, if you want a homework assignment to read Second Samuel 22, which is David's song of praise after he has been delivered from all his enemies and compare it side by side with this chapter, chapter two, verses one through 10. What we would find is that both singers rejoice over the victory granted them and deliverance from their enemies. Both speak of the Lord as their rock and declare the Lord to be worthy of highest praise. Both speak of an exalted horn and both make mention of the anointed or the Messiah. And there's just a lot of parallels, which is a worthy, worthy study to lay them side by side. But, but here's the amazing thing. To think this simple woman from the Mount Ephraim area could attain the same dizzy heights of David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, and reach it before David was born is quite remarkable. And what we find in this praise song Instead of mourning the parting of the lad, which you could imagine, every natural affection, you would think she would be in mourning, she engages her tongue in a song of thanksgiving and praise. In fact, so remarkable was her spirituality in this day of declension. She's one of two women alive at that time who really saw things the way they were. The other was, we're going to see the unnamed wife of Phinehas, that wicked son of Eli, that when she saw what was happening, she called her son before she died, Ichabod. The word kabod is the word that we use for glory, weightiness. And Ichabod means the glory has departed. And she could see, she could see the glories departed from the land. She could see it very clearly. And, and here's Anna. She could see too. She could see the real state of affairs. And uh, she, she shows great understanding of, of God and his ways in a time of declension that is just so far above the men at this time in terms of her spirituality. It's incredible. Poor old Eli, these women had vision. They could see things the way they were, but it tells us that his eyes had become to wax dim. <laughs> and the old priest couldn't see it. He couldn't see things the way they were, but these women did. And I wonder sometimes, do our sisters have a better handle and perception on the state of things in our assemblies more than some of the men? My wife pointed something out. I won't go into details the other day. And it was absolutely true. And I just, I didn't see it. I, I, it was like, how did I miss that? She could see it. And again, just amazing how tuned uh, sisters can be to the true state of affairs. So um, this song of Hannah, it's a wonderful contrast, by the way, to her previous visit to Shiloh. Remember chapter 1, verses 9 through 15, she's weeping, she's in agony, she's, she's just burdened. And here, she's bursting 
with praise and adoration. And so, it, again, set it in contrast with chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. And as we think about this, we just want to say a few things about it in a general sense before we go into the specifics of verses 1 through 10. But she's very uh, aware, astutely aware of the sovereignty of God and his providential rule in every aspect of life. And that's one of the basic themes of this song, that even in a day of departure, God is still on the throne and he's still in control. And by that's a good thing for us to be reminded of in the day in which we find ourselves. He hasn't abdicated his throne. He's still seated there. And by the way, my Savior is seated right next to him on that divine throne. What a thrill to know uh, that at his right hand is one that ever lives to make intercession for us. But God is sovereign. His providential rule is still very clearly there. And it's a powerful affirmation of this woman's deep faith in the living God. And it's got three parts to it. In verses one through three, she's going to sing of God's character. And she's going to talk about who he is and what he's like in his character. And then verses 4 through 8, she's going to talk about God's working and God's ways. And then thirdly, in verses 9 and 10, she's going to sing about the future exaltation of the Messiah. And we're going to thrill, I think, when we see verses 9 and 10 and the great perception that this woman had. And she acknowledges, as we just run through again quickly, God's salvation in verse 1. Uh, she says, uh, I rejoice in thy salvation, the end of verse 1. Uh, she rejoices in his holiness, verse 2. There's none holy as the Lord. Uh, she rejoices in his knowledge, uh, in verse 3. He's a God of knowledge, by him actions are weighed, his omniscience. Uh, she understands his grace, in verse 8, that He's the one that takes the beggar from the dunghill and sets him among princes, all in his amazing grace. And she understands his judgment in verse 10, that the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. And so great understanding. And in fact, this song of Hannah has had a great influence on other scriptures. Psalm 113. Again, I'm going to give you lots of homework this morning just because I want to stick to the text as much as possible. But it would be good for you to read Psalm 113 and compare it with this. And clearly the psalmist in Psalm 113 is, is influenced by Hannah's praise song. Also Mary's Magnificat in Luke 1 verses 46 through 55. There's echoes of Hannah in Mary's prayer. It's amazing. So, so this is very influence, influential. And by the way, we've got some other songs of women prior to this. You've got the song of Miriam in Exodus 15. You've got the song of Deborah or Deborah, depending on how you say it, in uh, the book of Judges and chapter 5. And so women are given to song. Our New Testament opens with two songs, really, the song of Elizabeth and the song of Mary. And our hymn book is chock full of beautiful hymns that were written by women. Francis Ridley Havergal, Fanny Crosby, Hannah K. Burlingham, Mary Bowley Peters, beautiful hymns, rich in expression of great theological truths that have been distilled into song by godly Sisters who have meditated and contemplated on the things of God and found expression in their pens in how we thank God for these things. Well, notice that this prayer, there's no dead formality in her heart. She is giving this prayer out of a full heart. And again, I wonder what a contrast this woman's prayer must have been and how precious it must have been to the Lord compared to what he had been receiving from Shiloh, from Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. And again, I have to say, and I want to make this as practical as I can, but sometimes at the Lord's Supper, I wonder 
if the real aroma that ascends into the presence of God is from the silent worship of the sisters rather than from often the pathetic or awkward silences of the men who really have nothing, nothing good to say about their savior. And again, I've mentioned this before, but I never forget being in an assembly and I've been in this more than one, but this one stood out particularly. The Lord's Supper was absolutely embarrassing. It, it was awful. Uh, um, my son, who was eight at the time, wrote me a note, passed it to me, and he said, what's wrong, dad? Isn't that amazing? An eight-year-old can tell, and I wrote back, there's death in the pot. By the way, that assembly is closed. It's no longer existing. And when I heard it, I wasn't a bit surprised. But it was just embarrassing. But at the coffee break, I want to tell you something. The same men who had nothing good to say about the Lord Jesus were waxing lyrical about a college football game that they'd all obviously spent hours watching the previous day. And let me tell you something. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so, and I believe the, the Lord's Supper is a wonderful temperature gauge of the state of an assembly. And based on some recent experiences, I would say that we're in bad shape. And people's hearts are not where they should be. And so what a, what a challenge Hannah should be to all of us this morning. It says Hannah prayed and said, in her heart, oh, it's so different. My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Now, she prayed. It's not a prayer of petition now, but praise, thanksgiving, a celebration of the divine perfections and the glorious attributes of Jehovah, the God of Israel. And the reason it's called a prayer is because, even though it's very evidently a song, is that it's addressed to God very directly. This is who she's speaking to. And um, it's worship welling up in her happy heart. Her child is now installed in the tabernacle, starting his lifetime service to the Lord in answer to prayer. And that was such a joy to her. And as we look at the, the prayer, we, we want to just observe too that only in verse one does she mention herself. And very briefly at that, only a brief word by way of introduction, she mentions herself and then she disappears quickly from view. And after verse one, it's all about him. And that's, I think, when we enter into true worship is when self is lost sight of and he becomes our all in all. May God lead us into true worship where we lose sight of self and move into that realm where our, our, our preoccupation is with who he is and what he has done and how worthy he is. So she begins by saying, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. And I wonder, two significant things in this opening uh, expression that I want to bring before us. Two significant things. First of all, the heart. We've already mentioned that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We think of Psalm 45, verse 1. The psalmist there, my heart is indicting a good matter I speak concerning the king. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. No wonder the writer of Proverbs could say this, guard your heart, keep your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. And it's good to ask ourselves a question, even this morning, where is my heart this morning? Is my heart overwhelmed and, and just overjoyed and just in passionate love? with my, my Savior, my Lord Jesus. And it's, it's amazing. That, so the first thing is, 
the heart. The second thing I want you to notice too is the focus. She is taken up with the giver and not the gift. As she sings, her joy was not so much with the gift, Samuel, but with the giver, God Jehovah. She doesn't actually mention Samuel in the prayer once. But she mentions Jehovah nine times in ten verses. If you just take a look at the L-O-R-D capitalized, uh, verse one, she prayed, said, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord or in Jehovah. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord, in Jehovah. There's nothing, there's none holy as the Lord, as Jehovah, verse two. Uh, talk no more so exceedingly proud, let no arrogancy come out of your mouth for the for the Lord or for Jehovah is a God of knowledge. Verse six, Jehovah killeth and maketh alive. Verse seven, Jehovah maketh poor and maketh rich. Verse eight, at the, at the end there, uh, it says that the pillars of the earth are the Lord's or Jehovah's. Verse 10, the adversaries of Jehovah shall be broken in pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord or Jehovah shall judge the ends of the earth. And so nine times, 10 verses, her focus is on the Lord. She's just over, overwhelmed with him and his greatness. And so she says, she prayed and said, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. Now, the horn, I want to think of it from two aspects in scripture. One that we're very familiar with, and that is the fact that the horn usually represents strength or power, uh, like that of an ox or, or, or uh, some uh, animal. You know, the, the guy with the biggest horn wins, that kind of idea. Uh, you see that in the book of Daniel, where they're the, the little horn and all this kind of thing and uh, these these battles. Let's just look at a couple of references just to see how horn speaks that way of, of power and strength. Book of Daniel, uh, chapter 7, for instance. Daniel 7, verse 21. <clears throat> it says... I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Uh, this is this end time ruler that's in view. Uh, we, we saw in Zechariah, we won't turn there, but when we studied Zechariah chapter one, uh, the four horns uh, that were pushing. Uh, and, and again, it usually, it just speaks of, of strength, of power. And when it says an exalted horn, uh, it, it, the idea is that, uh, the head is high, conscious of strength, an awareness of strength. And so Hannah's sense of strength was in God. Her horn is exalted in the Lord. Her, her strength is in God who's answered her prayer. She can face any foe because her God keeps pouring strength into her. Invisible power was his, and through her that power flowed. And so the idea is that uh, her horn, her power, her strength, which was really from the Lord, uh, she's, she's really uh, just giving God glory for that. Now, I want to look at it from a second aspect. I want you to look at First Chronicles. First Chronicles 25 in verse 5. First Chron Chronicles 25, verse 5. And this is to do with the musicians that were arranged and ordered by David for the worship of God. It says in verse 4 of Heman, the sons of Heman, Bokiah, Mataniah, Uziel, Shibuel, uh, Jeremoth, Hananiah, Hanani, Eliathath, uh, Gidaltai, so on and so forth. I think we'll just, uh, it says, verse five, all these were the sons of Heman, the king's seer in the words of God to lift up the horn. And God gave to Heman 14 sons and three daughters. All these were under the hands of their father for song in the house of the Lord. And so to lift up the horn, 
these horns also were used as musical instruments. They're a symbol of strength, but also were used in the worship of God. You've seen uh, the picture of the shofar, right? And uh, an uh, animal horn that's, that's adapted and used to sing God's praises. And so along with the sons of Z Asaph and Jeduthun in the temple court musicians, uh, Heman's part and his sons was to sing aloud the praises of the God of Israel, to lift up the horn. And so what is she doing? She is using her strength to lift up the praises of the God of Israel, celebrating him in his infinite perfections, him who is worthy in her estimation. And so this is what she's doing. She's exalting in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. So she's rejoicing uh, over her enemies, of course. Perhaps initially Penina is in view because her rival had taunted her so often. But I think it goes even beyond that. I think she sees in, in Samuel that the enemies of Israel, particularly at this time the Philistines, that their end was in sight. God was exalting uh, himself to destroy the enemies at this time. And again, she, she believed that. She had confidence that God was about to turn the tide for the nation. Her mouth is enlarged over her enemies because notice it's plural. It doesn't say over mine enemy. It's not just, it's more than Penina. Uh, maybe she got a lot of taunting from others too, but, but maybe she's thinking beyond that. And the, the enemy that's bringing them into subjection at this time uh, being uh, the Philistines. So by faith, she rejoiced in God's deliverance. Because I rejoice in thy salvation. God is the deliverer. God has delivered her and he's delivered us. He's our deliverer. We should sing his praises because of his salvation, because of all that he has done. And then in verse two, she moves uh, away from self completely now and she says there is none holy as the lord there's none beside thee neither is there any rock like our god and so she's captivated with the holiness of god completely absorbed with him and it is a fascinating thing that if you study the subject of the holiness of god you'll find that holy is the prefix that is attached to God's name more frequently than any other prefix. So we talk about God being almighty and all wise and all these other things, but holy is used more than anything. 30 times he is called the Holy One of Israel, very directly, specifically the Holy One of Israel. Uh, he's Isaiah 6, where when Isaiah is caught into the presence of the Lord, the throne room, he hears God's proclamation of the, 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 the seraphim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And so we just, we marvel in the, the holiness of God. And the fact that there's none like him. Let me just look at some other references about his holiness. Exodus 15. Exodus 15. Verse 11. 15, 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness? fearful in praises, doing wonders. And, and so the uniqueness of God, the God of revelation, the God of scripture, is that he is a God of holiness. And so many of the gods that were worshipped by the heathen were immoral. They, they came down and, and had uh, sexual relationships with humans. They were, they, they were they were wicked gods, they, and, they, and of course their worshippers reflected the God who they worshipped. They, immorality and, and idolatry went hand in hand because the gods who they worshipped weren't holy. But God is unique in that he is the holy 
God, the only unique God who is holy, the God of revelation. And again, book of Psalms in Psalm 30, 30, Psalm 30, as we think of this great holy God. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. And so this God, she is taken up completely with the holiness of God. And I wonder, did she feel a personal sense of revulsion at what she witnessed taking place in Shiloh? Because it tells us directly that the sons of Eli were wicked. And yet here they are, supposedly representing a God who is holy. And the high priest, remember on his headpiece, the golden plate, holiness unto the Lord. And yet here is a dear, dear sister who understands and is captivated with the holiness of God. And we need to pay attention to the holiness of God. Just as much in the New Testament, Peter would write to Christians in his day and say, be ye holy as I am holy, saith the Lord. And we saw in 2 Corinthians, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And we need a holiness movement amongst the people of God. Uh, we need to be a true reflection of the God who we worship. And holiness should uh, characterize his house. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, the psalmist would say. And so how we need to pay attention to the holiness of God. And she is captivated not only with the holiness of God, but the uniqueness of God. There's none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee. No God you know, in the pagan world can compare. They're not gods anyway. We know they're not. They're, they're demonic beings that present themselves as deities, but they're not. They're not God. There's only one God. The Bible's clear. And she was clear on that. But she also knew that these gods of the nations could not be compared. And here's the tragedy that the nation of Israel, if they'd have been more of the stamp of Hannah, the history of Israel would have been very different. But the great sadness of the history of Israel is that they were captivated by the gods of the nations and went after them. This afternoon, I'm going to be speaking about Josiah. And one of the things he's got to do is a massive cleanup operation because there's, there's shrines and, and groves and to all the gods of the nations. Some of them put there by Solomon, no less. And all oh, Israel's history would have been so different if they could have grasped the uniqueness of the God of Israel. And so do we recognize the uniqueness of the God of Revelation? Sometimes people will say to you, well, we all worship the same God. And in saying that, they, they betray their ignorance of the God of Scripture. God, the God of Scripture, is different to the God of the Quran. God, the God of Scripture, is very different to the gods of, of Hinduism. He is holy holy, holy, and there's none like the Lord. And she understood it. She grasped it. And she knew the uniqueness of God. And she said, not only is there none beside him, neither is there any rock like our God. And what this shows us is that this, this dear woman from Mount Ephraim, knew her Bible. She was very acquainted with the scriptures. Now, it wasn't a big Bible by all, you know, it's, but the Pentateuch's big enough. When you start reading through the Pentateuch, it takes long enough to go through it. She knew the scriptures. And I wonder in her days of uh, grieving and difficulty, how she meditated on the scriptures to find comfort at those days. But she knew the Bible and she knew that one of the designations, the titles that is ascribed to God in the book of Deuteronomy 
is that he is the rock. I want you to look back to Deuteronomy 32, because this is what's in her mind. And uh, others, other uh, commentators have gone to great lengths to show that actually every line of this song of Hannah is steeped in scripture. And again, we don't, we, we would be spending the rest of our series uh, in this chapter if we were to pursue that line of thinking. But this is a good place to at least see where she is coming from. Deut Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Actually, we should have backed up to verse three. I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. So God, the rock, verse uh, 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. By the way, doesn't that tell us a, a very important lesson? The great danger of prosperity. When Jeshurun waxed fat, when it, it grew thick, in other words, when it was prosperous, it forsook God which made him and esteemed the rock of his salvation. And you find that the more wealthy a society becomes, the more it sees its lack of need of divine help. And it turns away from God. And it's very difficult. People in persecuted areas like China often pray for Christians in the West because they recognize that our trials are actually more trying, more challenging than persecution because prosperity. And remember the church that is the one that gets the sternest rebuke in the Revelation churches? The one that said, I am rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. Laodicea. Verse 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. So we, we see very clearly in this chapter, Deuteronomy 32, that the, the revelation of God the rock is so clearly seen. Look at 2 Samuel 22. Remember I said, uh, be good to take the time to compare and uh, see the, perhaps the influence of Hannah on the sweet psalmist of Israel. Chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation. There's the horn, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. Look at verse 47 of the same chapter. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. And then please, I want you just to look at another passage that gives great relevance to you and I, and that's 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, New Testament commentaries on the Old Testament are the best commentaries on the Old Testament you'll ever find. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4, and they did all drink of that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. And so when the Lord says to Peter upon this rock, I'll build my church. He's not thinking Peter. The whole chapter is not 
who do men say Peter is? It says, who do, do men say that I, the son of man, am? And Peter confesses, you're the, the Christ, the son of the living God. And the Lord says, on this rock of who I am, I will build my church. I'm so glad the church is not built on Peter. Often used to say this in Ireland, that Christ is the rock and all other rocks are sham rocks. Shamrocks, they're fake. <laughs> Christ is the sure foundation. Aren't you glad, by the way, today, that the, the, the sure foundation of the church is the fact that it's built on Christ. And he's building it. I will build my church. It's built on him. He is the rock. He is the solid, sure foundation to build your life upon. And so, and again, we, 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 we should uh, take the time really because the, the, the scripture is full of analogies to this idea of the rock. I want to look at just one more, Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Psalms of David, 63. And uh, 62, should I say, 62 and verse 2. 62, read from verse 1. Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And I really believe this is a pertinent message for the day we find ourselves in. These are shaky days, aren't they? The economies of the world are shaking. The pestilence or whatever it is, the plague, whatever you want to call it, pandemic is spreading throughout the world, even to the highest office of the U.S. It's going everywhere. It's no respecter of persons. Everything around us seems to be crumbling. But how secure more secure is no one ever than the loved ones of the Savior. Why? Because we're built on the rock, the Lord Jesus. And what a wonderful thing to recognize the security, the assurance, the stability of being able to say, God is my rock. And like Hannah, to ascribe greatness to our God the rock. There's none holy as the Lord. There's none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. May God encourage us through the amazing overflowing heart of this dear sister from Mount Ephraim, Hannah. What she can teach us is worth learning. Amen.